Good afternoon. I am Lois Oliver, and I'm going to be reading the three memoirs. For a number of years, I was in an Ollie class on memoir writing with a whole lot, with 10 people in each class. And over the years, we got to know more about each other than the average person does get to know about other people. And so I'm going to, the first reading that I'm going to do, oh, and our memoirs, uh, bits of our memoirs were published in, in a book by Ollie, which I have. And one of the class members for a number of years with me was Bob Wilkinson, who lived at at the forest. So I'm going to read the first, the, a memoir by Bob Wilkinson called My One Day in History. In early June 1941, my father's destroyer had her home port at Pearl Harbor. So my mother and I returned to live in Honolulu for the second time. We lived in a civilian-owned apartment composed primarily of military or civil service families. With the exception of living expenses, life on Oahu was close to idyllic during those Depression years. All this changed abruptly one Sunday morning. On December 5th, 1941, my father's ship, together with other ships, comprising the USS Lexington Carrier Group, were ordered to sea to transport a Marine Scout Bomber Squadron to Midway Island. This was thought to be a milk run, and we expected my father's ship to return in time to celebrate Christmas in Honolulu. Early that morning, we drove my father to the pier where his ship was moored. As we walked along the pier to his ship's gangway, my father looked down at me and said in an unusually somber voice, I hope you never have to see a war. This made no impression on me at the time. It was later that I realized the full import of that statement. My mother and I remained at the pier until my father's ship and the others had steamed out of the harbor. Watching the ships underway was a thrilling sight for me. When they were out of sight, we returned home to resume the life of Navy dependents with husbands and fathers at sea. We did not suspect that when we next saw my father, our world would be changed dramatically. My father's statement was not prescient. Throughout the Pacific Fleet, it was thought that the rapidly deteriorating US relations with Japan would result in some form of confrontation in the Pacific region and Southeast Asia. No one but Japan's senior military and her emperor knew fully, knew the folly of this assumption, nor guessed that the confrontation would be on the United States island doorstep. For the civilian population on Oahu, early Sunday morning, December 7, 1941, began no more dif differently than any other Sunday. I arose at about 7.30 and quietly tiptoed to the front door to get the Sunday newspaper. The newspaper with the eagerly awaited bunnies had not arrived. Disappointed but reluctant to return to bed, I briefly considered doing my weekend homework. With only a faint sense of guilt, I quickly dismissed the idea. Retrieving Saturday's newspaper, I read the sports section and idly glanced through the rest. By about 8.30, I was bored. Nine-year-old skinny boys do not practice quiet contemplation well. My mother was still asleep. I turned on our small Philco radio, keeping the volume low. I do not recall the precise words, but from the radio came a shaky voice announcing, Pearl Harbor is beginning is being attacked by foreign airplanes believed to be Japanese. All Army and Navy personnel are to report immediately to their bases or ships. All liberties, passes, and leaves are canceled. This is not a drill. Over and over again, the horrendous announcement was repeated. I ran to my parents' bedroom and shook my mother's shoulder, excitedly saying, the Japanese are attacking Pearl Harbor. Wake up, the Japanese are attacking Pearl Harbor. 
She awoke and sitting up asked, what did you say? I repeated what I had heard. Robert, go upstairs to Ro Lieutenant Ryan's apartment and wake him up if he isn't already up. Tell him what you heard on the radio, now. I turned and ran out the front door and up the stairs to the next floor. Reaching Lieutenant Ryan's apartment, I alternated between pounding on the front door and ringing the doorbell. After what seemed hours to me, Lieutenant Ryan came to the door and opened it halfway. Standing in a disheveled bathrobe, bleary-eyed and obviously angry, he growled, Robert, why in hell are you banging on our door this early? Go back to your apartment. Staring up at his none too friendly face, I sputtered, the Japanese are attacking Pearl Harbor and you're to go to the base. As I was speaking, he abruptly slammed the door in my face. Bang! Then, within a second or two, this door swung open. Lieutenant Ryan said, what did you say? I repeated what I'd heard on the radio. As life insurance, I added that my mother had sent me up to tell him. That clinched it. Without closing the front door, he ran back to one of the bedrooms. I heard tense, muffled voices coming from the bedroom. I turned, and as I descended the stairs to our apartment, feeling ill-treated and unappreciated, Lieutenant Ryan bounded past me and down the stairs two or three steps at a time. His pants were barely on. He wore no shirt other than his white skivvy shirt, and he clutched his naval blouse in his right hand as he raced out the main apartment door. I heard a faint, thanks, Robert, go home to your mother. Moments later, I heard car tires screeching on the pavement as he gunned the engine and sped out of the com complex's garage. Entering our apartment, I found my mother dressed and listening intently to the radio. Within the next half hour, the, the apartments were devoid of men. Women and children were milling about in the center courtyard between the two apartment buildings. Some were, spread, were spreading, each one, rumors were spreading, each one more frightening and less reflective of reality than its predecessor. With the naivete of a child, I questioned my mother. Wars only last a few weeks or months, don't they? She looked me in, at me and slowly spoke. Probably a bit longer, but remember, we are Navy, and we all stand together and to face whatever comes. My most vivid memory of that morning is my mother and me standing outside in the courtyard with several other mothers with their children. We heard the unmistakable drone of an airplane approaching at low level. I assumed it was one of our planes. I looked up. A single engine plane with a big red ball on its fuselage and wings flew over us very slowly. The cockpit canopy was pulled back, exposing the pilot. As I stood gawking up at the plane, I saw the pilot in his aviation cap and goggles looking down at us. His plane was so low that I could discern the major facial features that were not obscured by his goggles. The plane flew on. A short time later, we heard a boom. Some thought it was a bomb explosion. The sound was so distinct that it seemed to have occurred within a few blocks of us. If seeing the enemy plane overhead had not rattled those of us in the courtyard, the explosion did. Regardless of its source, it was sobering. As the morning progressed, even as a young child, even a young child was aware of the emotionally turbulent atmosphere. In the first hour, we thought we could hear faint explosions coming from the direction of Pearl Harbor. These sounds were more than our, our collective imaginations. While they may have come from Pearl Harbor, the rumblings were more likely coming from Fort Shafter or Hickam Field. They were much closer to downtown Honolulu. Distant police car, fire truck, and ambulance sirens were heard intermittently for several hours. As the hours crept by, each new rumor added to the anxiety. Until the next day, my mother and I did not know how my father and his ship were faring. Moreover, he did not have any idea as to whether we were dead or alive. 
until the carrier group returned to Pearl Harbor. Early that Sunday afternoon, Mrs. Wallace, my mother's particularly close friend, telephoned. She asked if my mother and I would spend the night with her and her two young daughters, Susan and Miriam. The Wallace home was a large two-story home on a hill on the outskirts of Hawaii, of Honolulu. There were only a very few residences within a half mile of their home. Her husband, an aviator stationed at the, Mar that the Marine Air Base, did not want them to be alone in such an isolated area. No one knew what to expect. More airstrikes, possibly an amphibious assault. My mother assented, and we each packed a small suitcase and drove to their home late that afternoon. I was less than enchanted at the prospect of having to spend time with girls younger than I. From a to radio news announcement, we learned that a total blackout was ordered. No lights of any kind were to be visible after sunset. This included matches to light cigarettes and the light from the end of a burning cigarette. That evening, the two girls and I were sent to bed early, another indignity I had to accept. Sometime in the late evening, a distant siren pierced the darkness with its jarring crescendo de crescendo shriek. Another attack? My mother and Mrs. Wallace rousted us from our beds and hustled us downstairs. They directed us to crawl under a grand piano in the living room. There was just enough room for three children, another assault on my ill-founded sense of male responsibility. They placed mattresses around the piano. I remember asking what you, that is, our mothers, were going to do. My mother responded with something to the effect that they were perfectly safe, and this was only a precaution to keep us from getting in the way. Even I did not believe that and said so. If any of us had been asleep, we were not now. Mrs. Wallace put a 78 RPM recording on the turntable of her console radio record player. The album she selected was Peter and the Wolf. After playing the four records, she did not change the selection and kept playing them over and over again. After several renditions, I prayed for the wolf to eat Peter. No luck there. It took several years before I'd even grudgingly consider listening to that composition. As we settled down under the piano, I wondered what to expect in the morning. Fatigue outweighed discomfort and worry. I slept as did the girls, awkwardly curled up under the piano. At dawn on Monday, December 8th, the enveloping, enveloping darkness of the uneventful night seemed to have nurtured the bleak feelings of the day before. As the sun ascended and no sirens were heard and no enemy ships were seen on the horizon, I believe we all experienced a glimmer of hope. Not surprisingly, the sounds of Honolulu were subdued. Scattered gray clouds with wisps of black smoke arose in the direction of Pearl Harbor, yet the sky elsewhere was a reassuring topaz blue. We listened to the radio for any information that might dispel the oppressive sense of uncertainty. The mothers tried to distract us with various proposed projects. It was bad enough to be in a war, but I was mortified at the prospect of playing with two girls younger than I. About mid-morning, Major Wallace came home briefly for a clean uniform. He asked my mother and me to stay until my father's ship returned and to consider moving in long, term, in long term until the families returned to the States. We reluctantly agreed. To be honest, I was the uh, reluctant one. One day with little girls seemed more than enough, but I did not have a vote. As a nine-year-old boy, I loved ships. Some boys of that era focused on baseball team's trivia. I prefer to learn the ships of the, the names of the major ships in the Pacific Fleet. And in many instances, the ship's numbers, their tonnage, and major armament. I had accumulated a collection of matchbook covers issued by various US naval ships. The covers bore a silhouette of the ship, the ship's name, and the ship's ID number. Most naval vessels, for morale purposes, provided these individualized matchbooks to their crew. 
When my father's ship returned to Pearl Harbor to refuel, he was able to come home for one night. Early the next morning, we drove him back to his ship. Upon arriving at the outskirts of the naval base, some black-gray smoke was still visibly snaking upward. The smell of burned diesel oil and scorched ship's paint was pervasive. The base was in partial ruins. Ships that could mount our national ensign flew it from the stern flag of staff at half-mast. The first impressions of what I saw was emotionally staggering. Ships were afloat, but listing, or in various degrees of being sunk. Ship superstructures were distorted and twisted as if by some enraged sea god. Neither still photography nor movie sequences can fully portray the destructiveness of the scene before me. Years later, my parents told me that when I first saw the damaged and partial, partially sunken ships, I cried silently. It was not fear. It was a loss of my ships. They, kept, they said, I kept saying over and over, the ships, the ships. Such was my peripheral experience with the major moment in our nation's history. For my mother and me, the next three months on Oahu had a far less jarring effect and included moments of unintended comedy as the city and her citizens went about adapting to an unknown future. While almost all dependents left Oahu before Christmas, my mother and I, as well as the Wallace, did not leave until March 1942. So that is a glimpse into the beginning of the Second World War. The next is from a, a, uh, a woman who was born and raised in Strasbourg, uh, Strasbourg and, uh, and came to the U.S. Uh, as a graduate student uh, to the University of Kansas. And, and this is her memoir about a trip back uh, to North Africa. And the title is Mish Mushkila. From 1990 to 1991, I taught linguistics in the English department as a Fulbright scholar at the University of Algiers. I had applied for Algeria as I wanted to revisit the country in which I had lived from 1955 to 1965. I was yearning to discover the warmth and refreshing sense of humor so particular to Mediterraneans who make you look at life with a twinkle in their eyes. When I arrived in Algiers in late August 1991, the starting date of the fall semester was not yet determined. Lack of funds, inadequate facilities, and substandard student housing were among issues raised for a considered strike, uh, university-wide strike. So I, I was told I didn't have to start up for a while. Why not visit my daughter in Morocco? Here was the perfect opportunity. No need to weigh the pros and cons. The instant decision to go came naturally. Leela had been living in Rabat since 1989 on a student Phil Fulbright fellowship. I had a car I could drive west to Rabat in Morocco. It would certainly take two full days counting military roadblocks on the way and hours waiting at the border for customs formalities. But the thought of the trip excited me. Missionary acquaintances from long ago happened to live in Wauran, Wauran, formerly Oran, on the Mediterranean coast about a third of the way along my intended route. I could drive to Wauran the first day and spend the night there. No sooner thought than done, I put a few clothes in the trunk of my Opel and filled a cooler with food and beverages bought at the embassy food locker, uh, to take, including some beer and wine to take to Rabat. Because of the dismal economic situation in Algeria, I was allowed to purchase food at the embassy store, a real bonanza. I informed my startled landlady of my absence, 
Inn was on the road early. The drive to Waran was longer than expected, but without any major problems. There were repeated delays at checkpoints. But there, then there was a cordial visit with the Butler family that evening, and we reminisced about our experiences over 30 years ago, tried to fill in the gaps, and measured the dis, in, intuitively measuring the distance that separated us. There was a certain warmth and a feeling of shared community that had withstood time. Early the next morning, I was on the road again. It was still dark when I left Waran, driving west toward the Moroccan border. The landscape along the road became desolate, with few villages here and there along stretches of dusty, bare land. Not much traffic, either. I had mixed feelings about my early experiences in Algiers, especially as far as the university situation was concerned, though I had met a few personable colleagues at the gathering in a private home. As I was driving along, my thoughts drifted across the Atlantic to my children. I imagined their present life. Sylvie had found her niche in San Francisco among like-minded friends. She felt increasingly at home in the cosmopolitan environment of San Francisco that suited her well. Patrick and Diane, recently married, came to mind with graduation clips and wedding scenes. They were so young. Why the rush? My son had just graduated from college, eager to prove himself in his first engineering job, yet equally dedicated to his passion for running. I turned the pages of my mental album, A Kaleidoscope of Images, not in any chronological order, nor obviously connected. The road in front of me seemed endless. The landscape was desolate. Vehicles were few and far between. I scrutinized the horizon for signs of the border of a border city of Mag Magina. Nothing, no clue, just endless wasteland. More thoughts and images invaded my ride mind, and I now imagine my daughter Leela in Rabat. We had shared so much during her slow, lengthy recovery following a tragic car crash in 1983. After the physical trauma, there was painful rehab, and then the mental anguish over her friend's sudden, unwarranted death and her own apparent random survival. Since then, Leila's tremendous zest for life and commitment uh, to causes that mattered to her have been prominent in her life. Now, I had happy thoughts about seeing her tonight in Rabat. Suddenly, the 18-wheeler emerged in front of me, huge and ominous, crossing my path. With all my might, I pushed my foot on the brake, and then all went dark around me, a huge blank. When I came to my senses, I was bent over the steering wheel. Dust filled the car, and I was covered with shards of glass. The front of my Lilliputian car was crumpled into accordion metal folds, squeezed against a huge towering truck wheel, a surreal sight. After a while, I unbuckled my seatbelt and stumbled out of the car, numb, detached, an onlooker to an event unrelated to me. Two men stepped out of the unscathed semi, concerned looks on their faces, and addressed me in a mix of Arabic and broken French. Was I hurt? Was I all right? I was in a daze. I didn't feel anything. They examined my wrecked car closely, deliberating with each other, scratching their heads. What next? We were nowhere, literally out in the boondocks. No habitation anywhere around, no sign of any living creature other than ourselves. The men talked, gestured, taking verbal control. I leaned against my damaged car, dazed, an unconcerned bystander, frozen under a paralyzing spell. Then all of a sudden, I felt a sharp pain in my right foot. I tried to wiggle it, the hurt sensation both painful and reassuring. I was alive. A beat-up sedan came along the road and stopped. Its driver joined the truck drivers in feverish deliberations. Now three men were talking and gesturing. And after a while, one of them approached, trying an unconvincing, reassuring smile. I heard the familiar Arabic phrase, mish mushkila, no problem, no need to worry, repeated several times along with emphatic hand gestures. 
Then, without ceremony, all three men left in the sedan, leaving me with, my, with the semi in my erect car. Mish, mush, kila, no problem. Really, I saw a problem. How would I get out of this? What would happen next? Would the men get help? Would they send, would they call the police? They left the semi, so surely they would be back. I got back in my car, leaned back in my seat, closed my eyes not to see the huge, menacing 18-wheeler in front of me. After a while, I felt compelled to assess the scene of my wrecked car, the truck blocking the road, and its huge wheel so incredibly close to my steering wheel. And then, as I inspected the space under its body, it dawned on me, had the impact occurred in the space between the truck wheels, the top of my car would have been sheared off, and I would most likely not be alive to ponder at all. After what seemed an eternity, a dusty, beaten-up pickup arrived and stopped. The semi's two truck drivers emerged, along with another Arab man who approached me and addressed me in fluent, heavily accented French. He introduced himself as Mr. Stambouli, the owner of the 18-wheeler, a businessman from Clemson, a city several kilometers away. After ensuring himself that I was all right, I could move, talk, he informed me that the police in Algeria did not come to accident sites unless there were severe bodily injuries. I just nodded. My face must have projected my feelings of helplessness. In a kind, gentle voice, Mr. Stambouli tried to reassure me. He would help me out. I should not worry. Miss Mushkila, hadn't I heard this before? At this stage, I had no option other than to trust this stranger. Now I watched a scene I would never forget. Mr. Stambouli and the truck drivers picked up the broken car parts, which were spread on the ground, and placed them carefully on the bed of the pickup. Mr. Stambouli then pulled out ropes from his pickup and, with the help of the truck drivers, tied the wrecked car to the back of the truck. I climbed into the cab of the pickup as directed and sat gingerly on the passenger seat. And we drove off slowly, ever so slowly, on the road toward Clemson, several kilometers away. The wrecked car would zigzag right and left, but the ropes held and we eventually reached the outskirts. To my bewilderment, Mr. Stambouli drove straight to his personal property, a large house surrounded by a huge fenced backyard. He opened its gate and pulled my wrecked car inside. Your car could not be left anywhere on a curbside. It would be stripped of all its usable parts in no time. He then pulled a large tarp from a shed in the yard and with the help of some young men who had suddenly appeared, tied it over my wrecked car to protect it, he said. I was flabbergasted. He then invited me inside the house and in a few terse instructions that showed he was in charge here, asked his mother to take care of me. Lala Aicha struck me right away as a kind woman, her wrinkled face revealing the trials and tribulations of her life, yet she was at peace with herself. She spoke Arabic and no French, so there was little communication between us, but her eyes said it all. In her large, surprisingly modern kitchen, she brewed a strong Turkish coffee for me. Sure signs of rare opulence, a large refrigerator and an oversized freezer caught my eye. Could I possibly have some ice and a plastic bag, I inquired. Sure. Leila Aisha filled a plastic bag with ice and I wrapped it around my foot and tied a bandana around it. Other family members joined us in the kitchen and in more or less fluent French inquired about what happened. I was really in no mood to talk, not wanting to divulge much about myself, certainly not about my having lived in Algeria years ago. I kept my identity to a strict minimum. An American of a French background recently arrived in the country to teach in Algiers. Welcome, they repeated, repeatedly. Meanwhile, Layla Aisha poured more coffee and pushed a plate of homemade pastries toward me, encouraging me to eat. I wished I were home. Mr. Stambouli reappeared and offered to take me to the airport some 30 kilometers away to get a flight back to Algiers. 
Apparently, nothing could be done that day regarding accident declaration, insurance, potential car repair, as all offices were closed for some holiday. I would need to come back during work days to complete all the formalities. Again, I recognized another hurdle. All I wanted was to be back in my place in Algiers hiding under the covers. It occurred to me that I needed to empty the trunk of my car before leaving. We pulled back the tarp and I sorted out my belongings. I gave the food that I had perched, as, perched at the embassy to the Sambulis, making sure that none of it would infringe on Muslim dietary beliefs. The Coca-Cola was particularly appreciated as none was available locally. As for the alcoholic beverages, I was, of course, taking them back to Algiers. These were more or less forbidden goods in the conservative Muslim milieu. I packed each bottle in a black plastic bag, tying knots securely, and was given a large kufin, a local rope basket. Packed all the bags inside, securely tying the handles together with heavy-duty string. By now, I had experienced so much unexpected assistance and kindness that though I still felt numb, fear and apprehension were no longer an issue. I was just exhausted. At the small provincial airport, I faced an unexpected challenge. Being a foreigner, I was supposed to pay my fare in devises, meaning hard French currency and not Algerian dinars, that were not convertible on the mon monetary market. These were the rules, but I didn't have the required devises and was in no position to sway the airline clerk. Mr. Stambouli came to the rescue, assertive, imposing, with forceful language and commensurate gestures. He intervened until I had an Air Algeria ticket in my hands. There were still several hours before the evening flight, and Mr. Stambouli uh, insisted I should eat something, though I didn't feel like it. He enlisted a young boy to escort me uh, to a small cafe. At the cafe, I re vaguely recall that I ordered something that my young escort was eager to eat and then went back to the airport. I was the sole passenger so far for the evening flight, at, which was still close to four hours away. I tried to locate a newspaper stand, no such luxury. Instead, there was a Muslim prayer room, which is not what I was looking for. Along with the kufin filled with the sealed plastic bags tied in knots around the forbidden alcohol, I also carried a small red cooler, a souvenir from the Gott Company, for which I had done some translations years earlier. The cooler became a focal point for the police officers, especially when I took out some ice for my foot. Where did you get that ice? What is it intended for? I explained again and again, their doubtful looks and incredulous smiles, that it was a good thing to put ice on a swollen ankle, said it all. Really? Strange? Never heard of that. I was glad their interest focused on the cooler and not that of the cofan. Tired of unsolicited attention, I pulled out a, bag, a book from my bag, scanning the pages without reading them. The short flight to Algiers was uneventful. A taxi took me home. I was finally able to contact my daughter in Rabat to inform her that I would not make it. Later on that night, as my chest felt tight and somewhat sore, I looked at myself in the bathroom mirror. A large purplish blue line was imprinted diagonally on my chest. The seat belt had left its mark. I considered it somewhat in a daze and slowly realized how lucky I was. Suddenly, the phone rang. It was Mr. Sambouli inquiring whether I had returned home safely. A modern day story of the Good Samaritan. I had read of Arab hospitality towards strangers in stories from bygone places, but this was the 90s, not the Arabian Nights. Moreover, Algeria and France had raised one of the bloodiest wars imaginable for seven years. Deep-seated grudges, if not outright hatred, were still rampant. What I experienced that day had a profound impact on me. It belied the negative stereotypes about Arabs and Muslims so prevalent in French society and across the Western world. And the last is a 
short memoir from me. And this is about my family. The Jones family reunion. Except the two years during the war when we didn't have a car, we went to Ella Jean and Ray Faith's farm every July for the Jones family reunion. Ella Jean, my mother's cousin, was the youngest daughter of my grandmother Annie's oldest sister. Ray had a big dairy farm in Fayette County, Pennsylvania, and all the Joneses gathered there for a day. Everyone brought food, and Mother always brought a Lady Baltimore cake. Since my grandmother had 11 brothers and sisters born between 1869 and 1895, sorting out the Joneses was a significant problem. With great regularity, my dad said that he was never able to sort them out. Every year, Mother would patiently explain who belonged to whom, but it was never really clear. The reunion began mid-morning as the chores had to be done before the fun. Ray Faith was a big, round man with a weathered face and a great sense of humor. Ella Jean was a smaller, round woman with a big heart and a big smile. The reunion was filled with talk, jokes, tales from the past, and games. We city kids were always taunted in the butts of farm humor. Mother was always hailed uh, to join in as one of the senior members, except that mother, my father, as, be, accepted because he had the wisdom to marry Annie, her father. We city kids loved the barn, the haymow, seeing the, seeing the farm animals. At some point, each of us tried milking a cow with no success, followed by ridicule from the farm kids. The men played horseshoes, we kids played softball or hide and seek, while the women talked and arranged food. Then we all ate quite a lot. The memory of freshly killed and roasted chicken, country ham, fresh vegetables, fresh salads, homemade bread and butter, beautiful jams and jellies, pies, cakes, and ice cream still lingers. The face had four children, Louise, Bill, Jane, and Marjorie. For inexplicable reasons, Bill was called June or Junie. He was named William Ray, so it was not so it was not a junior, even though that was probably the source of the nickname. I always thought calling this big burly boy June was awful, but he didn't seem to mind. The summer that I was ten, I stayed on at the farm after the reunion ended. I was excited to be away from home in such a wonderful place. I got up early with everyone else, standing around helplessly while all the family said about milking 40 cows. I was told not to touch anything or get in anyone's way in the barn. Marjorie explained the milk had to be kept very clean and the barn was inspected regularly for cleanliness. The milking was all done with milking machines and poured into big cans in a special room where the cans were sterilized. Each day, a truck would come to pick up the milk and deliver a new set of cans. The first evening, Ray told me about the canary in the basement. I thought he was kidding, but he sent me down to see it. There was very little light in the basement, but there was the birdcage with a pretty yellow bird in it. He told me that the coal seam from the valley mines ran under their property. It had been burning for many years and was approaching their area. If the canary dies, we will have to move the cows and ourselves elsewhere until the fire burns through, he said. I checked on the canary several times while I was there. I think Ray knew I wanted to do something to help. So he asked me if I would like to bring the cows in from the pasture in the evening for milking. I was thrilled. As I was going out the door, he said I could take the dog along, who would be a help. The dog and I walked for a quarter of a mile to the pasture. To my surprise, the whole herd was standing patiently at the gate. I opened the gate and their rush toward the barn almost knocked me over. I had to run to keep up with the cows and the dog. When we all arrived at the barn, the cows strolled in and each one went to her own stall. I was feeling quite proud, even though I had not done anything but open the gate. I went to the house to report to Ray that the cows were in the barn. He looked up from his paper and asked, did you close the gate after the cows came out? Yes, I did, I said. He sighed. Well, I guess we'll have to go up and open it in the morning. Usually it stays open overnight. I was feeling less proud 
and offered to go up and open it. But he said, I did fine. Over dinner, he said, Lois brought the cows down for milking tonight. The other children all laughed and laughed. Bill asked, did she take the dog? Bray said, yes, she did. Then he turned to me and said, usually we just send the dog. Now everyone was laughing, and I was mad. The dog can't open the gate, I snapped, more laughing, as Ray said, oh, yes, he can. He just pushes up the bar with his nose, and the cows shove it open. By now, everyone but me was really having fun. Ella Jean tried to comfort me and hush the children, but it took me a while to recover. I was given other chores to do, and by the end of the week had forgiven them. I did warn my sister when she had her turn to spend a week on the farm. The Faiths did eventually have to leave their farm when the canary died and spent three years at another cousin's farm with their dairy herd. By then, their oldest daughter Louise was hosting the reunion at the farm she and her husband owned. They were still doing it after nearly all my mother's generation was gone. And that's the end of the reading.